So Linda, um, very nice to see you. If you want to introduce everyone and... Uh... Oh, I would love to. George, it is a thrill to be here uh, and support Cross Country Mortgage in your organization. You've been great to us for a long time and we Thank you. are so grateful uh, for your wisdom and what you've shared with us and we want to share you. back a little bit today. Um, I am here with two uh, really novel uh, pioneers, uh, people who think differently about the business. Um, this isn't just a couple of real estate agents who I thought, you know, were quick on their feet to talk. These are people who are trying to solve the problems for today, who are trying to think differently about this new normal in real estate that we want to discuss today. So with me is Bill Butler. Um, he is a coach and trainer at Leading Edge. Uh, he also has one of the best sense of sense of humor of anyone we know. So Bill, feel free to be yourself today because you make everything you're in fun and you've got some fun stuff to report today. Um, and with me is uh, Ramsey Fretz, a new member of our leadership team who has you know, just skyrocketed to uh, the top of production and um, also helps build our agents. And again, is thinking differently about the business. So I'm gonna start, George, with you. Um, I have some questions for you. Like, what strategies, George, are you recommending uh, for listing agents and buyers to embrace this current market? You've come up with a couple of quick things, and I actually have a slide for you if you want to talk about that top 10 uh, list of questions that need now to be asked when you're selling property. Yes, well, thank you, Linda. Um, well, the strategies that I recommend to listing agent and buy, listing agents and buyer agents um, that they should em, be embracing wholeheartedly right now are several. I have three words: Zoom, Zoom, Zoom. And right now, um, you know, I, I see some listing agents I've spoken to that you know historically at this time of year have 10, 12, 15 listings, and they're sitting by the wayside just saying. Well, they don't want me coming in. Uh, buyers are afraid to go out. So we have to adapt and adopt these new technologies. Um, buyer agents, listing agents, client calls with your buyers and sellers. You need to create a connection more than ever. You know, now we can't see them face to face. So setting up a Zoom call, setting up a, you know, get a connection, build a connection and alleviate their fears and show them that you've got this. You have some of these ideas that you might pick up today even, but we need to have a plan. This is new. We can't just sit back and just wait for things. We have to assume this is the new world. Become a thought leader uh, with, with consistent emphasis on consistent videos. Maybe every week, label it. You know, we have now the mortgage scoop. I, uh, this was something I, I do a lot of face-to-faces. I've done seminars. I'm good live, but I'm terrified of videos. I do about 30 takes and I'm like, oh, that's horrible. That's horrible. That's horrible. But we need to get out there and just do it. Uh, Facebook Live is a good one as well. But, um, you know, come out as an example. Uh, one of the strategies, get out there and talk about last year at this time, rates were in the mid fours and now in the low threes, it'll get you maybe 30 plus thousand in buying power. Co-brand with, with another, uh, co with a partner, an attorney, a lender, talk about stats, you know, that homes are still selling, there's still a large demand. Maybe there's uh, less of an inventory, so you're, you'll have a higher demand for your property. Buyer agents, this is very, very important. You're, the stronger the pre-approval letter that you have now is more important than ever. Don't let that pre-approval letter get stale because I'll tell you this, day to day, week to week, lenders guidelines are changing. I've heard lenders now with minimum FICO scores of 700. The pre-approval letter might have been based on 670 or 650. Now that loan is no longer good. You don't want to find out that you based a pre-approval, I mean, an offer on a pre-approval letter that's no longer good. So stay in touch with your lender. Uh, what I do with my team, I have a large team. We have someone on call every weekend. We know for a year in advance that someone's on call. When you're making your offer, we want to be spoken to before the offer goes in so we can reevaluate, run the numbers with the buyer to make sure they're comfortable and make sure that this program is still in effect you know, all the Fannie Mae and government loans are all out there. Jumbos, depending on the lenders, some lenders have shut off the jumbos because of the illiquidity in the marketplace. 
Um, some of the FHAs used to be able to qualify with a 580 score. Some lenders are now at 660, so be careful about that. Uh, mass housing, many lenders have stopped selling loans uh, to mass housing because of concerns with having to buy back the loan. So please do not take that stale pre-approval letter and use it as the Bible anymore. You need to be in touch with your lender. Ask them the 10 questions that we were talking about. They're good. This is good for both the buyer and the seller, uh, seller agent and buyer agent. Uh, those are very pertinent questions you should be asking. Who gave you the pre-approval letter? Is it, is it truly a pre-approval letter or is it a pre-qualification letter? Many lenders are very busy, are busy with the low-hanging fruit refis right now. They don't return calls. They're not spending the time to do the due diligence. Be very, very diligent right now. Ask them the questions. This 10 questions is invaluable. Tell me, what, what did you do for a pre-approval? Did they submit your tax returns, pay stubs, bank statements? Not, and more importantly, who reviewed these, uh, these documents? Was it an underwriter or was it you, the, the loan officer? And what gave you the authority to give a pre-approval? Because loan officers typically do not have that authority. So be very, very cautious. Listing agents. Robert, can we take a break here for a second? Um, yes, yes. So, I mean, you've just, got, you've just laid a lot on us right now. Yeah. That the lending environment is differently. That we have to ask different questions. Yes. Um, I thought you were predominantly that zoom, zoom, zoom is the way to go. Right. Um, and I'd like to circle back later and actually go over those 10 questions, but I think we have so many other things that I'd love to absolutely to move on to now. Um, yep. So can, uh, can we go to Bill? Because Bill did something wicked cool yesterday and um, it, experimental. Everyone's doing kind of new ways to do open houses, but Bill, would you be really super concrete about the property, about how it was sitting, and how you wanted to give it a whole new, fresh introduction to the market? Absolutely, uh, Linda. We made history today. I mean, I, I don't want to make you know a huge deal about it, but it was historical. Um, so, so people will be uh, writing about this for years to come. It, what it, you did. The Chronicle, the movie, I'm getting calls for movie rights. It's, uh, it's <laughs> unbelievable. Um, so I have a listing in Somerville. It's a condo. Uh, and we listed the day before the mayor of Somerville shut the city down, before Boston was shut down. Uh, in addition to that, the mayor of Somerville also said, uh, realtors are not allowed to show condos where people, multiple people are touching the same doorknob that don't live together. And that is the case with this, with this particular property. So we marched on, uh, we did get people showing it. Um, we eventually got an offer after being on the market for three weeks. To be um, clear, virtually showing it. Correct. Right. Um, we got a full price offer. They ended up getting cold feet. We uh, talked to my clients. Um, they understood. I said, we you know, we want to go back. We've got to give, we've got to do something. We got to try something new to relaunch this listing. And so what we did yesterday was held a virtual open house. Um, we put it together very quickly. And if you want, I can kind of go step by step on what I did. I, I'm sure there's a better way to do this, uh, but I can kind of give you a bead on, on how we were able to do it. Um, I scheduled the open house um, in the MLS with the open house icon and in the comments wrote, this is a virtual open house to be held on Zoom. Here it clicked the link to register. The cool thing about Zoom is that when you subscribe, to be able to hold webinars, which is a $40 a month fee on top of the $15 a month pro subscription. Um, you are able to um, uh, have people register to get the link to be a part of the webinar. And in the registration, people are asked for their name and email address. So Bill, you're capturing the same info um, that you would get on an open house sheet, except they're not actually lying about uh, what their email is. That's the beautiful thing. If you, if you put mickeymouse at gmail.com, Mickey's gonna get the link. 
<laughs> so, um, so in order to promote it, we, we kind of threw it together at the last minute. Um, so it was a Wednesday, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was, it was Wednesday and we put it together on uh, Tuesday. Um, so I, uh, posted it in the uh, balloon part of the MLS uh, open house notification. I also, to be clear, I didn't want to have people coming thinking it was a normal open house. To minimize that, in the very first line of the public remarks, I noted we were having a virtual open house. Here is the link to click to register to go on the to go to the open house. Um, I then promoted it on Facebook. Now, this property had a Matterport 3D tour, if everyone's familiar with the Matterport 3D tour, where you can virtually walk through the property. I think that's going to be the norm for every listing moving forward. Uh, but in order to kind of catch people's eye in the scroll economy that we're in, um, I shot a little screenshot of me walking through the condo in the Matterport app. So it looked like you were kind of walking through the condo to maybe catch some eyes of people. And I had the link. Great. I felt like an avatar when I watched it. It, yeah. it was yeah. really kind of cool the way you just screen captured that and gave me a real tour. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so, and then the other kind of, because I'm a nerd, um, as Ramsey knows, uh, I I wanted to see how many people would click, would, you know, would come from different areas. Now, I later learned you can do this in Zoom. But what I did is I assigned a different URL to the um, property description, the public remarks, uh, and uh, Facebook. And uh, so I could tell how many people were clicking on the link to register from each spot. Bill, what was, were you surprised by the outcome of that or wh where did, where did most of the market show up from? So not terribly surprised. Um, I, and you're better off doing this in Zoom because you can tell actually who actually ends up registering where they came from. Um, but 14 people clicked on the public remarks link, which was more than I thought because we didn't change the price on this listing at all. It didn't get sent out. To ever, I'd already put it back on the market, BOM status. Um, so I thought it was interesting that 15 people clicked on that link or 14 people clicked on that link. Bill, I think that means also that people are really lurking right now, waiting for property, wanting to see it. And so if you've got 15 people who are willing to um, or are going back into the history of properties just to take a look if anything has changed, I mean, that's a really good sign. It just means that we've got more buyers who are hungry, who can't, who don't feel ready to actually go out and look. Yeah, I know Zillow and, and Realtor.com hasn't reported a huge decrease in traffic on, on their website or people. There's less new people coming, but there's a lot of people uh, searching. So um, we had 25 clicks to the registration page, all to 125 clicks overall to the registration page. Um, we had 91 from Facebook and I also sent out an email to the reverse prospect function for the listing. So all the other agents that had, uh, buyers with, with searches set up for this property, we had 21 clicks from there. Uh, all in all, we ended up with 16 registrants for the open house. Out of those, we had, um, 11 agents and five buyers. Now, if you would have told me, hey, Bill, we're just going to hold a, uh, a uh, open house uh, Thursday night, a commuter open house or Wednesday night for a listing that's been on the market for a month, um, I would have been thrilled with five buyers coming to that. And you would have gotten zero agents to look at it and talk about it. Right. Exactly. So that's, that's impressive. So I was very encouraged with that, especially when we didn't even promote it for an entire 24 hours. So walk us through, Bill, how you conducted the open house, because I know that Eileen Hamblin, our business partner, said she was so engaged with the way Bill showed the house that she almost bought a condo in Somerville last night. And I'm following up with Eileen uh, <laughs> as we speak. Um, it will make it happen. Well, we got to get creative here, Eileen, right? Um, so uh, basically, I made the decision to do it, obviously, on my phone. 
So I was using the matter or the Matterport, the Zoom app on my phone, was able to log into my account and start the webinar on my phone. Um, as uh, I, I think I started about five minutes to eight minutes to three. Um, people started, we had a couple people logging in and I just said, well, since you guys are here, I'll go ahead and walk you around. Um, and we had the open house from uh, three to four yesterday. So it was an hour long. Um, we, uh, and I would basically, uh, I learned that if you hold it in landscape mode, it's a better picture versus this for the end user. So pro tip uh, number two, uh, hold it like that. Uh, and then you have to be very careful as you are talking about the property to not move too fast in a property. You, you, people will get motion sickness if you're moving this around like this. So you have to be very methodical and slow about moving things around. And, you know, it kind of brought me back to, um, I, you know, selling real estate uh, 20 years ago where, you know, the listing agent did talk more of before pre-internet. You did kind of have to highlight things about the house because all the information was in the book. It wasn't online. And so um, it kind of brought me back to those days where we're kind of showing everybody. And now I'm, you know, I'm filling space. So I'm talking about the light. I'm talking about the neighborhood. I'm talking about and kind of giving people the, the tour of the property walking through. I asked people, um, there's a chat section or and a Q&A section. So I ask people, if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A. Um, and then you get notified on, uh, on the interface when there's a new question every time one pops up. We ended up having 10 questions uh, total, 10 questions and comments from uh, agents and buyers. Um, the uh, as we were kind of walking around, new people would come in. You can get notified with a bell or a chime signal as new people enter. Uh, you can welcome everyone by name. All their information pops up right there. Um, I found that the buyers that did attend were very appreciative of it. Uh, they also had no idea how to proceed, which was funny. They're kind of, you know, one comment was, okay, I'm here. What, what do I do now? <laughs> okay. <laughs> And we kind of joked about it. I'm like, hey, I don't know. You tell me, you know, where do you want to go? So we had some fun with it. Um, I think there's a lot of potential here to build rapport, more rapport faster with, with this process than obviously in an open house where 50 people are coming in at once. Um, uh, I noticed that. I'm following up. There were certain questions. We went into the basement for where the storage is found out that the signal was cutting out when you went down there. People will tell you that, uh, they'll help you through it. So that might be something to test before you hold one is kind of, is the signal okay everywhere in the property? But Bill, uh, I'm pretty sure that people would be much more forgiving. If you showed up two minutes late to a regular open house and they couldn't get into the basement and stuff like that, people would be upset. But given that you're giving a, a new way to see something and an access that they didn't have before. I'm, I'm sure people didn't really mind and were, were comfortable with you, you know, moving the camera too quickly once or twice or not being able to connect in the basement. They're going to be much more forgiving, right? Yeah. Yeah. People completely understood and great reason to follow up with everybody. So after the open house, I went down, took a little video of the storage area. And now uh, I sent that to everybody last night. Hey, you know, sorry, couldn't get into the storage area. Here's a quick video of it. Would love to uh, know your feedback when you have a chance. You know, are you thinking of buying? Thinking of buying in the next 90 days? Um, so that's underway. Um, I think at the end of the day, there might be some. Uh, there's definitely some room for for improvement. Uh, but very, very encouraged. We got that type of traction with such little notice. At three o'clock on a Wednesday afternoon. Uh, People are going to take breaks from work. People are at home. Um, I remember, if you go back to when we used to read the Sunday Globe, that we got more traction on Monday when people went to work. They would read their Globe on their employer's time. So <laughs> I think the same principle applies here as well. 
Yeah. It's, uh, it, it, and it, people really appreciate it. There was one woman who really wanted to see the windows up close. So we got real close to the windows. Here they are, the replacement, but older. Uh, questions of how many outlets are in, you know, does it have a lot of outlets in these rooms? Yes, there was a lot of that. And then the fantastic thing, and I don't know if I can share my screen on this, but Zoom gives you um, a basically a spreadsheet that obviously got all the attendees information and then all the questions that were asked. Oh. So it's a great report when your sellers say, how did it go? Here are all the people that came. Let's see, I can see if I can bring it up here. We would love to see that. This is just totally novel. And to remind everyone, this is an unoccupied condo. So we, you could get access and show it. And um, as Bill works on getting that up, do you want to just um, weigh in a little bit? Oh, I think he's got it now. All right. Yeah. So here's the attendee report. Here it says when they came, how long they were in the meeting. Wow. There, all their on information. And then here's the Q&A report. So all the questions that people had and so the seller is absolutely gold. Yeah. It's showing you are doing something, you are taking action. You are absolutely taking action. So I know it's really fresh from last night, but any other kind of interesting feedback from any of the buyers who were engaged? Um, I think, uh, like I said, they very much appreciated the opportunity. Um, they were able to get their specific questions answered uh, and very much appreciated it. Um, so stay tuned. We'll see what happens. Can't wait to see. So I'd love to segue to this whole topic of occupied versus uh, unoccupied property because we're really seeing trends in this business and if today's discussion is about the new normal and the future real estate and I guess that's what I want to just lay bare right now is that we are all been waiting for this cloud to lift and for us to just go back and do real estate like we were you know in February and and behind that when in fact that's not going to happen uh, then we're looking at the earliest we'll see a vaccine is probably fall of 2021 and then we have to vaccinate everyone um, this will not be dictated by government decision to you know allow us in and out of property or what the showings are this is going to be dictated by consumer behavior of people who are concerned about catching the virus or uh, potentially being exposed to something and harming a loved one that's what's going to drive consumer behavior going forward. This is not going to change. And anybody out there who is waiting to buy, sell property, an agent who's waiting to put property on or work with buyers, um, I don't. they're waiting for two years. I think it's time for everyone to understand this is our new normal. Things will get back a little bit more as we go to restaurants and can walk the beaches. Um, but for the most part, things aren't changing. We need to embrace these new um, new ways of doing business now. And we're gonna talk about that in a little bit, but I'd love to hear from Ramsey about what he's seeing occupied versus unoccupied. And well, I, I think first of all, Linda, you're, you're correct in that this is not gonna be changing in the short term, but people's understanding and feelings towards it will. And so as you know, I would say a month ago, you know, we've been in lockdown for quite a while now. A month ago, I'm, you know, hidden from the world and don't want to do anything. And now I'm just about ready to run outside with a mask on and start, you know, trying to live life again. But of course, it's not quite time for that yet. But we will start to see a transition where people will just need to continue moving forward with business and life. Um, the really nice thing is the real estate market has not really slowed down through this. I, I think we're all surprised at how much activity there is today. I think... Um, as George talked about earlier, the, the, the power of a low rate is also very strong right now. But specifically on that um, occupied versus unoccupied property is, um, and I've said this before, but usually on MLS, you're going to get the best of the property in that first line or two. You're going to get the thing that really is the wow factor for whatever reason or whatever the property's uh, special features are. And now the first line is often unoccupied property, easy to show. And so what we're seeing the biggest change in this market is if it's occupied, it's really difficult and often cases not possible to show it. 
And if it's unoccupied, we're actually, and I don't have the data yet, but I'm assuming that there's going to be a uh, larger gap in prices than we've ever seen for occupied versus unoccupied, because right now access is everything. Now, Bill gave access in a very different way than anyone has seen really so far, and he got a lot of traction from it. And so people were really excited about seeing a property that they really couldn't see in another way. Um, but I do believe that the, the most important part of getting a property listed now and prepared to list is going to be getting it empty. Um, now there's going to be a lot of cases and I don't know if you want me to dive into kind of the whole multifamily market now. We can wait on that for a bit. No, we um, can do that. But I think we did an interesting, just a short survey, but when we looked at the under agreements last week at leading edge, 90% of them either were unoccupied properties or had asked the seller to evacuate Mm -hmm. so that we could sell a secondary it. home a going to the Cape. It's a huge trend. And if you walk through a house a year ago, uh, we kind of talked about this and it's kind of an estimate, but I would say at least 80% of them were occupied. There was not a lot of vacant homes that we were selling and that's completely switched. Uh, I do also believe that that means that there is a lot of sellers right now who are waiting in the wings. I personally have a lot of buy sell clients that are going to trade up or trade down. They're not selling right now because if you live there and you don't have to move you're not really listing your house at this moment. Um, but I do think that we're going to continue to see a trend towards um, access. And if you can give people access and the best way right now is to do individual showings, private showings for a vacant home, uh, you're going to see a lot more traction on those properties. Ramsey, so you, um, do you mind if I ask you, um, what about multifamily properties? Let's say uh, someone owns a two or three family uh, and they have tenants that are terrified to have people walking through their home. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're obviously, People are not going to be evicted. You, you don't want to threaten them. You have to be sensitive to that. Uh, any top, any suggestions or ideas of how people can um, work with that right now? Absolutely. So um, I think that multifamilies are going to be one of the hardest markets to get back to normal because the tenant has a lot of rights, as they should, to not have random people coming through their space during their lease, especially in, in this time. Even when uh, there wasn't a pandemic, it can be hard to show multifamilies. I personally believe the brokers who transition their marketing strategy and their mindset around multis are going to do really well out of this. And I think it's going to continue. And what I mean by that transition is when you're buying an investment property, you are buying a cap rate return. You're not going to live there. And these are the people, this is not owner occupied with the one rental downstairs. I'm talking about strictly investment, two, three, four family units. You're buying it as a overall return on the property. So what's important, the ability to rent it. So we can look at the rental history. We can see if it's fair market or not. Uh, looking at the systems, looking at the location, looking at how um, this property has fared for growth compared to other areas. So the whole focus now on multis has to be data driven. Um, a lot of multis already before this pandemic started, uh, you'd see you get access to one unit. And then if you had an accepted offer, you'd get to see the rest because they didn't want to upset tenants. Um, I think we're going to see a lot more stuff like that. If you can get one unit vacant, you can do one showing. And then I think very importantly, every single multifamily now should have an attached inspection report for foundation, for systems, and for everything that's not actually in the unit. If I could go on and I could see a multifamily with a virtual tour, and by the way, we've talked before about uh, even having the tenants just take a video themselves. We're doing that on a lot of rentals. That's very helpful. But then having an inspection report of the roof, the windows, the systems, the siding, all of that is most of what the, is needed for the average investor. Uh, I work with a couple of investors who live in California and who buy in Boston, and I do a walkthrough video with them, and I get, I get an inspection report done, and that's all the data that they actually need. Now, if you have a fully occupied multifamily, you are going to struggle to get a lot of people to actually want to move forward without seeing it. Um, so just as Linda talked about getting, uh, you know, those buyer, or excuse me, those sellers out of the house, you know, if, as a business decision, it makes a lot of sense for a landlord to say, I'd love to rent you a house in the Cape for a month because we need to get a unit empty. Um, mm -hmm. I would love to spend the money to make sure that we can get the proper access. So we're probably going to see a bigger return from that. And I'll tell you right now, I think when the data comes out over the next 30 and 60 days, of unoccupied versus occupied homes and what's the, the sale prices, I think we're going to see a real gap there. Um, so I'm actually, I'm quite excited about this new market for multis. I have a very data-driven approach. I believe that 90% of what an investor wants can be done in an Excel spreadsheet. And then the last 10% is reviewing the actual property. Um, and I think the more we start to push that mindset, the better off we'll be. Love it. Thank you for that great information. Linda, do you mind if I ask you a, qu a couple questions? Uh, sorry, can I just follow up on um, Ramsey Please. quickly? Sure. Um, you know, I love this um, idea that we can move tenants out. And, you know, like Ramsey said, we're going to make more money. But 
when we talk about doing that, you know, landlords could be offering them X amount, $3,000, $3,500 to move your tenants out and let them choose the vacation home of their own. But I think you need to know there are some rules uh, right now, VRBO, Airbnb, you have to rent for a minimum of 31 days. So you really have 32. to do 32 yep, yep. days, mm -hmm. uh, 32 days. So uh, being aware that it has to be that kind of time and that also gives time to show it and then for any it's, germs to die before we bring the tenants back. So I just want to understand the logistics of that. No, absolutely. And it's a real investment to do that. I mean, asking someone to spend $3,200 or $5,000 or whatever it is, is a lot of money. But it's the same as when we go to a seller and say, we really think you should stage this property. Now, staging on average is a, I would say, what, a four or five X return. I think Boston it adds about 17000 on average in value with the average staging cost of about 2500 bucks. Staging is not decorating. Staging is a business decision. And so the same way that, you know, spending the money to get a tenant out. And by the way, the tenant can say no, that is their right. But what we're trying to do is create a win-win situation. But to spend that money and to, to actually allow the proper marketing and access to the property to happen, we know we're going to do better. Could be worth tens of thousands of dollars. That's the return on investment. So, yeah, all right, George. Yeah, 10x return on that. Yeah. Right. Great stuff. Uh, Linda, how do we shift the mindset of our agents? How do we overcome? How do we move buyers and, se and sellers out of the state of paralysis right now? Um, you know, anxiety about this pandemic freezes people. People get stuck. Um, yeah. Ramsey just referenced he has people who want to buy and sell, and they're just not going to do it now. See, I can't accept that. <laughs> Yeah. But, but so that but the thing is that that's already starting to change. Um, but right. there is, and like I said before, we will begin to see this new norm. Um, you guys, uh, Chesty Puller was um, a famous Marine general, started at the bottom, rose to the top. And his favorite line was lead from the front. Um, we need to be the ones who are pushing this change, pushing these new ways of marketing. Um, because the people who are following are the ones who are going to lose all of their clients and are going to see a very large period of failure. And I think for the agents who are out in front are going to get more exposure. And I actually think they're going to come out of this likely stronger than they were before the actual pandemic. So George, I'm going to go back to um, uh, the way real estate agents have been conducting themselves since basically 2012 is, you know, we've been teased. We're just order takers. We follow the direction of our clients. Our Clients want to buy something, we help them. Our clients want to sell something, we help them. But that's kind of the easy way. The agents who are going to really make it in this market are the, are the agents who take it to the next level and really very involved in their client decision making, not pushing. You can't push a client into buying and selling, they just push back. Right. But there isn't anyone out there that is thinking about buying and selling who doesn't have a problem they need to solve. Every buyer or seller has a problem or they wouldn't move. It's just easier to stay. And I think we need to remind people all the time about those problems in order to move them forward. We need to take and ask the questions that no one's asking to kind of um, be just a little bit more aggressive in a nice way, in a very respectful way, in a dignified way. But um, the agents are there just waiting to do what their clients want, aren't going to be selling a lot of real estate. And I'm going to go back to the silly example I had years ago. I had a Victor when I was still on the ground, a Victorian house that was, it, it had, it had bones as they said, but everything needed work. There were squirrels living in the walls. Um, everything was kind of wrong with this house, but it had nice features. And I met a couple who came to the open house. It was like, oh my God, these people actually like this house. Nobody likes this house. Um, it was in Melrose. They were in West Roxbury. They were coming for schools. I met them and then they just went silent. And I talked to them and they, yeah, they really liked the house and they went silent. And I went, I need a campaign. This, these people, their name is on this house. And if I think, if I just let it ride, they would eventually probably found their way to Melrose. But I, I took a position of, listen, guys, this meets all your needs. This, this house has your name on it. You understand this house. You can improve this house. This solves your problem of getting your kids into a better school system, into a better neighborhood, all of those things. And at the end of the conversation, they said, oh, you're right. You know, maybe we should do this. And then they credited later with, Linda, thanks so much for the push. Without the push, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't have taken that step. And I think Nobody in real estate likes to be pushy. And I'm not suggesting you be pushy, but 
they were really excited and they need our guidance. Our leadership in real estate is everything. And it, you have to lead your clients to where they want to go because it is way easier not to make the decision, to just stand, to freeze, to wait. But boy, if there's a, you know, if they're exploding out of their house, if they're, whatever their problem is they're trying to solve, if they need to downsize, if they need a better school system, if they want a better neighborhood, you know, they need to solve it. So I'm going to go back to one quote, if everyone's using the famous quote, um, the one I've picked up from Warren Buffett that I'm going to hold on to tight is Warren Buffett never makes buying or selling decisions based on today's headlines. And we all know what the headlines are today and they're scary. But if you need to buy or sell, that's what Warren Buffett does. He makes the move he needs to make to solve whatever problems he has. And I'm going to encourage people to do that. Great info. And just to follow up, at not now, but I do have uh, a, a video of our robot oh, <laughs> that can take photos. I've got uh, digital brochures. I've got a couple of things to show. Should I do my little show and tell? Please. Okay. Here's a little show and tell for everybody. I think it's great fun. Um, here, and I'm just going to do a quick clip. Matthew Murphy at um, Boston Virtual Imaging oh, does these videos, and here's his robot camera. Um, it does Matterport tours. Uh, when you're using something like this, you need to make sure if they're just going to hand the seller the robot that your house is ready for pictures. You know how we always fuss about things. So you're going to have to be walking through with your seller client in advance to remove the dish towel off the dishwasher and the pile of toy toys from here. And your seller has to lift this to the second floor. But we have a Matterport tour here, completely done without anyone having to have access of the house. Here's something else that's kind of fun to show. This is um, something we've developed, George. It's a digital brochure. So you get the, you know, you're not gonna have paper to show them, but I you can still do I just, I just text everyone. I just text everyone the the digital brochure now. Yeah, it's 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 actually it's it's a lot more convenient than the paper copy because the paper copy winds up underneath the back seat of your car and you lose it. So I, even even when we're out of this pandemic, I'm going to try to continue pushing just this because I actually think it's more convenient for the uh, the clients and, and buyers. Wonderful, and it's sustainable. So there are a lot of new tools we have that we can show people that work really well. Fantastic. And that's why it's leading edge. <laughs> Great. Um, George, I had one quick question for you. Sure. Um, yes. So just on, the, just on the approval process, I've had a lot of, um, or some offers go in and um, I think it's really, it's almost as important what kind of job they have now as the actual approval. Are you guys doing any kind of focus on, you know, how safe the job is? Are you kind of making sure that when you talk to that list agent, how secure they are outside of just a standard approval letter? Ramsey, excellent question. Uh, it's funny you mentioned that, uh, you know, it was, it was interesting about two weeks ago, I was asked for the first time uh, by uh, a listing agent, George, um, you know, excellent. I'm glad it's you, it's, you know, I, you know, I love your pre-approvals. But I have a couple other questions. And I'm, and I'm like, wow, oh, okay. What uh, field of work are they in? I'm like, oh, it's here now. And it's, you know, because I'm concerned, are they in the service industry? Are they work, do they work for restaurants? I said, well, I'm glad you asked. I said, um, uh, it's a couple. Um, he works, he's a police officer and his wife is a, a school teacher. And, you know, immediately the listing agent was thrilled about that. But again, this is something buyer agents, uh, sell, you know, selling agents, very, very important questions to ask, you know, not to say that we, you know, we want to take care of our clients, we want to help them. But, you know, when you have 22 million, as of last week, people that filed unemployment, this is a concern. Um, you know, we really need to know our bias. We need to ask the questions. As Linda said, we have to be better. We have to inform. We have to guide. Where uh, you as the realtor, you know, you're their psychologist, you're the therapist. You're guiding them. You have a rolodex of all kinds of, uh, you know, contractors and uh, advisors for your clients. So right now, you really need to ask these questions and know what what field they're in. Um, so George, can we distribute these? There's there a way that please. Um, 
if people registered for the Zoom call, we or if you put your name here, is there a way Courtney or Bianca could get this to everybody? Yes, I'm sure we can. Um, you know, Courtney, yes, absolutely, Courtney, just answer. We can definitely email those out. Um, okay. These are 10 very important questions that buyer agents and uh, selling agents, listing agents should be asking. Uh, because again, you know, especially with the listing ag uh, agent side, you might have a, a domino effect that that first uh, property in the chain of multiple buys and sells could domino a bunch of different people. So we really want to ask a bunch of questions now more than ever. Uh, has it been underwritten? Uh, how old is the how old is this pre-approval letter? Um, have documents been submitted? Has it been underwritten by an underwriter? On and on and on. The questions uh, will be submitted to everybody. But so, George, I, it definitely sounds like the, what the people want now in this world is a quick no, um, because the worst thing that can happen <laughs> yes. is a slow no. Thank um, you. Yeah. And again, and and tighten up your commitment dates. Mm -hmm. You know, don't you know? Say you're closing two months out. Don't ask for a commitment letter, a financing date. Uh, seven weeks from now, tighten those up to 15 to 21 days, ideally, because the earlier you have an approval, the better. If, if the file has been pre-approved, if the client's been pre-approved, that means documentation has been reviewed. Obviously, there's an appraisal. Many, uh, we're now getting a lot of appraisal waivers. We're also doing desktop appraisals, which are computerized uh, with purchases. Sometimes they'll use the listing agent's pictures. So we're able to get these appraisals much quicker on purchases. So you really should be asking for much shorter approval times. Right. Um, I have one more thing. Does anybody see some quick, interesting stats about our market that should give yes. everybody, you know, so we can all jump and down that this market is moving. Please. So um, this is um, what I've just done here is month over month um, from the time. Let me do a little screen, share, screen, share, screen. Um, here we go. Um, what I'd like to show you is that I looked at that first month, March 13th to April 14th. That was the first month of lockdown, reduced showings, new ways of doing virtually. And what, and let's look at our market and what really happened here. So look at the um, single family inventory. Although it's down in every market, we still have houses to sell. Just, just like we are with the condo inventory. But condo inventory didn't go down very much. Look how small uh, that differential is. We're only dealing between one and a half and 12 and a half percent less condos available to sell right now. And multifamilies, because of tenants, are severely restricted on the market right now. We're looking at a, almost 50% um, in every uh, one of our counties that we predominantly do our business. But here's the most important thing that's crazy great. Although we have less inventory, look, there aren't that many less under agreements for that first month of COVID versus last year. We're only down 7% in Middlesex, 20% in Suffolk, and only 0.7% down in Essex County under agreements. This is unbelievable information. Um, when we go to condos, we're down about a quarter percent in any market, but remember there's less inventory. And then multifamilies, uh, we're down, Essex County was dead even. They're not down at all on multifamilies. So what this goes to show is that the market is as vigorous as it was before. We have reduced inventory, but if we can put it out there proportionally, we're selling as much, we just need to put more houses on. This is a game about getting the listings. Again, we've been saying it since 2012, but it is more important now because that's where the sales are going to be. Fantastic. Could I uh, ask a question to you, Bill? Oh, I think you might yeah, be new. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. There you are. I, one thing I want to say, I'm so impressed with what you're doing with video and your Facebook groups. Uh, do you mind just saying a few words about the connection you have with your local, uh, your town and your uh, Facebook group? Do you mind saying a few words about what you're doing with that? Sure. Yeah, no problem. So uh, probably about four or five years ago, I started a community blog on Facebook called Melrose Scoop um, and just kind of posted photos of what was going on and that evolved into video uh, and doing uh, videos, uh, basically interviewing community businesses, commu owners, community thought leaders, politicians. Um, and it wasn't very technical. 
all I did was use this. Maybe sometimes a tripod, uh, but most of the time it was done via this and a selfie stick. Uh, and throughout, so I've been doing those videos for about two years. Um, and it has not only opened the doors uh, for me for uh, many buyers and sellers, um, but my conversion rate for uh, those people has skyrocketed. Uh, it's been a great way, not only first and foremost, to give back to the community that's given so much to me, which is the first goal. Uh, number two, it's just uh, an incredible way to build rapport and trust quickly. Uh, so we've had a lot of success and we're doing uh, a lot of videos right now, um, especially right now as a way to uh, give back to these folks, these local businesses that need help. They, you know, they are pivoting as well, just like we are, obviously in terms of the services that they're offering and how they're offering them. We wanna make sure as many people as possible know about it. Awesome. Thank you. So I've been asked to read some of the questions. I, Nick, um, would it be a good idea to have all people going through your open house that they must have mask, gloves, and shoe covers? We yeah. at Leading Edge are not holding open houses, just opening them up to the public. I know it's happening out there. Um, I do believe we're doing more of a controlled open house where people have a chance to make an appointment during an appointed time. Um, I think absolutely any showing should have masks. Uh, and washing hands. There's a whole controversy on gloves as far as I'm concerned. You're just moving the germs around. Better to go in, wash your hands, the more don't of touch a, anything. Yeah, the more of the focus is on the mask is an absolute that, that needs yeah. to be there. The problem with a glove is that it brings along everything else you touched. I saw a yeah. picture on, I can't remember what site, but it was a guy in a grocery store uh, using his phone. So he was holding his glove in his mouth. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it is just a little scary with these gloves sometimes. The important thing is that they're no touch showing. So all the lights yeah. are left on. Um, I had a listing come on in Arlington, a vacant property. I told my clients, your electric bill is going to be huge. Your lights are going to be on 24 hours a day. Your cabinets are going to be open. You're going to touch the front door as the broker and then no one's going to touch anything else. I think yeah. that's what's most important. Yeah, I think Amy and Myra Tillotson were like, they're, they're calling them museum showings. Yeah. Don't touch, museum showings. Uh, yeah. Next one is, uh, Let's see, um, Kate, and you can make changes easier virtually on, you know, when you're doing things, yes. Um, be, anyone can email Bianca and she'll get you the 10 questions that have been uh, mentioned. Um, Bill, quick question for you that was on uh, one of the Q&As is uh, for the reports that were on Zoom. So you're saying that there's a $15 charge to just, you know, have the Zoom premium and then there's a $45 charge. Where do those reports come in? So it's a $40 upcharge to be able to host a webinar. And then that's where you get the reports. Okay. Yeah. The webinar. That was another question. I'll and, uh, take a look if there's a less expensive option than that. There was a comment that I think was intended for Ramsey about he looks too young to know anything about MLS books, but I think it was really for me. <laughs> MLS what? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, let's see. I think that covers everything. This has been a delight. Anything else for us, George? Uh, no, I think it was, uh, you know, we kept it to a reasonable time frame. I see we've kept many of our participants on. Um, I'd love to do this again with you all. I mean, it's been fun, uh, informative, and, you know, as things evolve, I'd love to uh, reconnect with everybody. Yeah. Thanks. Well, 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 this was great. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you, George. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks Rams. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.